Rural Heritage on RFD TV is brought to you by Rural Heritage Magazine, a bi monthly magazine featuring articles about farming and logging with draft animal power, small scale diversified family farming and homesteading, and other aspects of our rich rural heritage. Rural Heritage Magazine, borrowing from yesterday to do the work of today. For subscription information, please call 319 362 3027 or order online at www.ruralheritage.com. actual event started about 35 years ago here in Cedar Rapids and uh, it started at Usher's Ferry and we moved it over to the farm, better setting, more area. And uh, it's been growing. Uh, we had a pretty good setback during the flood in 2008. But it's growing every year and people have a good time. The farm itself has uh, four events during the year. Uh, three big events and one of them is in May and we start off with the gas engine show. So. We're very, I'm very concerned I guess and the, and the uh, farm board is concerned because if this uh, 1900 farm kind of disappears or doesn't stay alive, it will be gone. Uh, no one's going to build a 1900 farmstead and put equipment on it and so forth. So we're, we're very concerned that, that we hold it together and uh, basically all the revenue we get is off these events and that kind of pays the bills and keeps us going. Uh, I'm not sure why I do it as much as I do. Actually, uh, my father and a friend of his used to run a steam engine and a thrashing machine during the school year. And then they, I got involved with both of them down at Mount Pleasant and uh, got the bug uh, or the fever, whatever you want to call it, the infection, might say. Uh, started with some tractors and gas engines, so I've got some of those. And this friend of mine who passed away, he had, his uh, wife had them and I bought three tractors from him. I liked them and I played with them. Then I got into the steam engine business uh, quite a few years back. Uh, after running one, I had a chance to buy one. And in fact, the one that we're looking at right now was bought on our anniversary. So I, I'm not sure my wife Penny bought it for me or I bought it for her, but we bought it on our, one of our anniversaries. We were so poor one time, I can remember crying at the table because we didn't have hamburger, we had to eat sirloin steak. Cause that's what was in the freezer and that's what we had to eat. And I can remember saying to mom, I want hamburger so bad. <laughs> You're going to have to eat your steak, but uh, it was a good life. It was a good life, and but you know, there's a reason those folks didn't live long. They worked themselves. They worked themselves hard. Yeah, I think it uh, was more personal. It was very family oriented because the kids were an asset because you had to have help. I never could figure out why my father never bought a corn elevator. Uh, we shoveled it. And then I th realized one day, three boys, that's a lot cheaper letting them shovel than buying an elevator. Yeah, let me Steam tractor runs by burning wood or coal. You can see down inside the firebox. Uh, got a nice big fire burning. Um, and also while we're back here, uh, this glass tube here shows me my water level. You can see the, the boiler is about three-fourths full of water you know, from underneath the firebox clear up to this level. And then above that is space for the steam. We have to come around the side. Uh, this is what's called a locomotive style boiler. This square angle, uh, square area towards the back uh, contains the firebox. And we were just uh, we we're just looking at the fire from the back. And it's surrounded on all four sides, top and bottom with the water. And then from the front of the firebox, 
through this barrel section are a number of pipes that bring the hot air and, and flames from the fire through the water space of the boiler up to the smoke box. And that increases the amount of surface area for the heat to go from the flames to the water, it makes the water boil, turns to steam. Um, and this area here called the dome is higher than the water level, so the steam up there is the driest. And that's where we pull the steam off of, goes through the governor and into the valve chest of the engine itself and fills that with boiler pressure steam when we open the throttle. And then once the engine is running, between the valve chest and the cylinder, there's three ports and there's a valve that either connects two of the three ports at, at a time back and forth. The center one is exhaust, goes out through the stack, um, and then the, the boiler pressure steam from the chest goes in the outside ports. So if the valve is here, we've got steam coming in this way, blows the piston this way, and the steam that's behind the piston can go out the exhaust. And then the valve goes the other way and it blows the piston back the other direction. So every cycle of the engine we're getting two power strokes. Then uh, the piston of course goes to the connecting rod to the crankshaft and makes everything go around. Uh, and you also notice this belt coming off the crankshaft. There it goes up to this pulley here, runs this little thing with the three balls. Right. And you see those spin around? Right. And that's our speed governor. The faster they spin, the more they want to fly out from centrifugal force. And then it squashes down on that, the center shaft, closes a valve inside of there, shuts off the steam to the engine, the engine slows down, balls come back in, opens the valve, engine speeds up again. It can constantly float and, and match the load. The shaft comes over here, and this is known as the belt pulley or the flywheel. It continues the rotating energy of the engine taking it from cycle to cycle, you know, power stroke to power stroke. It is also a nice big wide surface to put a flat belt on to drive sawmills, thresh machines, whatever. And you can see there's just a little bit of a, an angle here with the center ridge, and that helps center the belt. So the, the belt wants to stay on the pulley. And then also inside the flywheel, you'll see these two wooden shoes, and there's a linkage in there that when we move the linkage, it presses the shoes against the inside of the flywheel, and that's what engages the road gearing, and the engine moves under its own power. So there's no gears. There's no first, second, third gear on a steam tractor. You just got one gear, and then for forward and reverse, you just reverse the entire engine. It runs clockwise or counterclockwise. It's just it's happy either way. What's the main maintenance task that you've got to do with a steam engine? Um, mostly just keeping up on cleaning the ashes out of the firebox every day, uh, scraping soot from the inside of the tubes on a daily basis. There's kind of a spring or round brush sort of thing that, that we use to do that. Uh, How many tubes are there about? In this one, 54. 54, okay. It's quite a few. In fact, we can look in the front. So there we're looking at the smoke box end of the tubes. And if you could get down low enough, you'd probably even see the fire on the far end. And then the exhaust goes up through this elbow, and the exhaust steam shoots straight up the stack. And that actually helps pull more air through the fire. So the harder work, harder you work, the hotter the fire burns, the more steam you get. Um, and just kind of works its own efficiency up that way. It's got a, uh, it's a, a kerosene lamp? Yes, the headlight is a kerosene lantern and it is fully functional. We use it all the time after dark. We've also got a couple other kerosene lanterns for the pressure gauge and the, and the water glass. Oh, 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 oh. We check one more. Here we come ahead. 
Uh, yeah, this is an insert tooth blade. Uh, it's what they went to in the later years. It's a lot more economical because we can remove a tooth to have it sharpened versus having to take the whole blade off and change the blade out during production they did in the 1900s. So this is what they went to. Uh, it's a real simple tool that we have. I changed out most of the teeth earlier, but... It's just a simple dog that holds the tooth in. And that's all the tooth is, just a little piece of steel. And we can still buy teeth today, they're still used in production today around the world. And that's all to it, changing the tooth out. So you buy the, new, you buy the teeth new, you don't sharpen the teeth? No, you can, these teeth are sharpenable. Um, these teeth will last me for no more than we run the mill, probably about three years. But uh, I just put this blade on last year here at the show because we, we hit something with my other blade, so this is my spare. So so we put, I've changed all the teeth out today because I haven't done it for a lot of years, so. 
but uh, it's a 56 inch blade that's as big as they made them back then this is the biggest blade that's out there so uh, how old is this mill uh, my dad and grandfather built this mill in 1970 so uh, they, they found all the parts the headstocks were originally from my uh, my grandfather's farm they, they were on the farm that's the only thing that's original to my family uh, my dad and grandpa fabricated and machined everything else out you see so they made it portable so we could take it to steam shows like we are here today so. the um the bell power coming from the steam engine is furnishing all the power for all the things that are happening yep, here that, yep it comes in on the other side and it's just it's a direct shaft straight through the through the sawmill blade uh, there's pulleys on the other side it's basically a, it's a friction system it makes the carriage move back and forth through the drum you see on the on the bed here. So yeah, the engine supplies all the power and uh, control the handle right here. That controls, I control the feet of the log through the blade. So the harder I pull it, the faster or, or the more aggressive I can push the log through the blade. So. What's providing the, is there a blower then for the dust? Yeah, the, there's a trough underneath the blade and there's a what they call a sawdust eater or a blower that, that vacuums the sawdust out. That's, that was more of a, a newer invention. It wasn't, you didn't have those in the late 1900s, but, but my grandpa looked all over trying to find one because then you could keep everything over there instead of building up underneath the sawmill when we was running, so. When you're cutting the log, you are trying to make a, a flat face or three flat faces and then you're cutting boards off of that? It just depends on what we're cutting. If, uh, if we're looking for just uh, dimensional lumbers, two by fours and two by sixes, yeah, you have to square the log you got to size up your log to see where you can get the most lumber out of it, and you square it up. I typically, the way I was taught, I square one side, then I lay it against the headstock, square the other side, because then when you lay it down, that nominal dimension, you can start making boards after your second cut. Uh, that's just how Grandpa taught me to do it. Everybody does it different. Everybody has their way. There's really no right or wrong way. But uh, if you get a good crew and a core, everybody's coordinated together, we can saw 3,000 board feet in a day and not really work that hard. So. Uh, if you get somebody out of sync, then everybody else has to work harder to pick up the slack. But, but like I say, we're just we're just trying to have fun. So, is but, this what you do for a living, Ken? No, this is no. This is a hobby. Just a hobby. So I have steam engines at home and sawmill. I have my family steam engine at home, and so this is just heritage I grew up with. That's all. summertime you could start them on kerosene but in the wintertime the kerosene wouldn't ignite so they'd have to start them on gasoline and run them on kerosene. Well, before rural electricity out on the farm anything short to be done washing clothes, pumping water, shelling corn, grinding feed, any little chore around the farm you either did it by hand or by horse or you did it with a gas engine. The life of these wasn't too long because they didn't come along until, oh, about 1900 or so. And in the 1930s, of course, rural electricity came along and put these guys out of business because electricity was so much easier and cheaper. Well, it's a basic four-cycle engine, just like you have in your automobile, only it's about as basic as you can get it. you got a compression stroke with gasoline and air, only there's just a mixer instead of a regular carburetor or fuel injection like you have now. So, but it just, there's no intake, uh, there's an intake valve, it just sucks it open with the fuel mixture in there, then you had a compression, an explosion, power stroke, and it's just a normal four-stroke engine. However, it runs very slow. This engine has two horsepower, but only 400 RPMs. Your normal, uh, like your lawnmower engine, a four horsepower, but that's at 3,600 RPM. So the, the torque conversion, if you, if you scaled this up, it'd be like a 40 horsepower if it would run that fast. But they weren't made to run that fast. They were made to, to mimic a steam engine. This is about the speed of a steam engine there. 
You notice it only fires once in a while. It's coasting. The hit and miss controls the ignition on the engine. There's a governor on the flywheel. When it slows down, it has a power stroke and it fires to speed it back up again. So on a, on a throttled govern engine, it fires every time and it throttles the amount of gasoline coming in. So like that one, it'll, it, it hits or fires every time, but it uses a lot more gasoline. And this one, because it only uses gasoline when it fires. So it depends on how much load you have on it. On, when you're coasting with no load like this, it's a lot more efficient than one like that would fire every time. I used to, years ago, you had to dig a hole in the ground to pump the water out, let alone there wasn't any hot water. If you wanted hot water, you took it in and heated it on the kitchen stove. And there wasn't even bathrooms then. You took your bath in the kitchen next to the stove where it was warm. So things have changed a lot in 100 years. And it made life on the farm so much easier. But there was cost associated with it too. When you're sitting there rubbing the kernels off the cob by hand, it didn't cost you anything. And gasoline wasn't easy to come by. This program is available for purchase. To order your copy, please call 319-362-3027 or visit www.ruralheritage.com. Rural Heritage is a bi-monthly magazine dedicated to draft animal farming and logging as well as other aspects of our rich rural heritage. It is published by Mishka Press, which also offers a complete line of back-to-the-land books, DVDs, and calendars. Call or write for a catalog or subscription information, or visit our website at www.ruralheritage.com.